and welcome to Spanish Answers, a podcast that gives you unas llavitas graves as you unlock your Spanish language adventure. I'm your host, Sarah, with Language Answers, and today in episode 86, we're going to talk about the differences between the popular verbs saber and conocer. Now, they both translate into English as to know, but be careful. Just like estar and ser are not the same, you can check out episodes 77, 78, and 79 for more information on that, saber and conocer also have very different meanings and cannot be used interchangeably. So hopefully today's episode will help you navigate when to use which one correctly. Plus, we'll finish up our cultural tip on the Dominican Republic with three fun and interesting traditions. So let's begin. Before we begin, just a quick update. I am so sorry. I got completely mixed up with the holiday last week, and then we had some internet issues, one of the few cons of country living, and so I am producing this episode a week late. A week and a day late. I will try to produce the next episode on time, aka next week, but we'll see. At least I was correct with the last episode. I'm making new mistakes instead of repeating old ones. Glass half full, right? (sighs) Now, I did try to add extra information to the episode just to try to make up for the tardiness. So again, my sincere apologies. And with that, let's go ahead and start with the history of saber and conocer. So why are there two verbs in Spanish that translate to English as the verb to know? Put simply, Spanish is a Romance language that evolved from Latin, the language of the Roman Empire, just as French and Italian did, hence why they have so many similarities. And Latin had two different verbs. According to the Real Academia Española, or the RAE, the verb saber comes from the Latin sapere. Oh, please forgive me. I don't know Latin, so I'm sure I'm going to butcher the Latin pronunciation of this. All of you Latin lovers, I apologize ahead of time. But the Latin sapere, so S-A-P-E-R-E. I'm pronouncing it with a Spanish accent. That can't be right. Ah, So anyways, (laughs) let's start over. Latin had two different verbs. And according to the RAE, the verb saber comes from the Latin sapere, S-A-P-E-R-E, and the verb conocer comes from the Latin cognoscere, C-O-G-N-O-S-C-E-R-E. Since I know, as I said, very, very little about Latin, I looked both verbs up on latindictionary.io and found that sapere means to taste of, understand, have sense whereas cognoscere means become acquainted with, aware of, recognize, learn, find to be, inquire, and or examine. So random fun fact, according to merriamwebster.com, sapere aude is a Latin phrase that means dare to know, and it seems to have been made popular, at least according to my very quick Google search, by the well-known philosopher Immanuel Kant in his answer to the question, what is enlightening? He translates this phrase, sapere aude, as have courage to make use of thy own understanding. Have I read a lot of his works? Nope. I'm sure my philosophy professor would be disappointed to hear that, although I doubt he'd be surprised. Still, I have included a link to his work in the show notes, just in case you'd like to see this phrase in action as well. But going back to saber and conocer, in essence, the modern Spanish versions of saber and conocer are quite similar to their ancient Latin roots. Let's take a closer look at them. First, saber. This verb is all about expressing knowledge regarding concrete information, such as facts or trivia or how to do something like playing the piano, writing out calculus, or wood carving. So here are some example sentences. Sé historia. I know history. Sé historia. I know history. Yang sabe hablar español, francés y chino. Yang knows how to speak Spanish, French, and Chinese. Yang sabe hablar español, francés y chino. Note how in this case, the verb saber intrinsically means knows how, so that you don't need to write out Yang sabe cómo hablar. It can just be sabe hablar, although people will add the cómo. If you want to know the difference between cómo and cómo, well, for those of you not reading the blog but listening to this podcast, Como with or without an accent over the first O, you can check out one of my original episodes, episode two, The Importance of Accent Marks. Man, have things changed since that episode? Woo! So please forgive the 
<laughs> it was one of my first episodes, guys. Anyways, you can also see it on YouTube, which is where I used to post the episode with the PowerPoint if you want to be able to read it, as it is so old that there is no blog for it yet. It's on the bucket list of things to do, but let's be real, that uh, might not happen. Anyways, let's continue with our example sentences. Ella sabe tocar el piano. She knows how to play the piano. Ella sabe tocar el piano. Mi suegra sabe cocinar cocina sureña. My mother-in-law knows how to cook southern cuisine. Mi suegra sabe cocinar cocina sureña. Now, you can add the word como with an accent over that first O if you're trying to say that you know or don't know the manner in which something is done. It adds a bit of nuance to a sentence. So, for example, No sé cómo puedes comer esa cosa asquerosa. I don't know how you can eat that disgusting thing. Compared to No sabes comer. You don't know how to eat. No sé cómo Puedes comer esa cosa asquerosa. No sabes comer. Now, the difference here is in the first sentence, you're implying that you don't know in what way or how in the world that person can eat something. But the second sentence implies that they literally don't know how to do the action of eating. Do you kind of see that, that nuanced difference there? You can also say, Sé cómo hacerla reír. I know how, or rather, I know the way to make her laugh. Sé cómo hacerla reír. Now, saber also has a few other meanings that you may or may not know about, although there isn't time to do an exhaustive list. So we'll just do a few. First is to taste, or to taste like, which now makes sense having looked at the Latin root. For example, esta pizza sabe muy bien. This pizza tastes great. Esta pizza sabe muy bien. Hombre, ese arroz sabe a comino. Man, this rice tastes like cumin. Hombre, ese arroz sabe a comino. Now, note how in this phrase, you use saber plus a plus the noun to express taste like. Taste like cumin. Sabe a comino. This can also be used figuratively as saber a gloria means to taste divine. I love that. Saber a gloria. Next, we also have saberse. When you use saberse, which is the pronominal verb form, meaning the direct object and the subject of the sentence are the same, such as with reflexive or reciprocal verbs. When you use saberse, then you are emphasizing your knowledge. Basically, this is how you would express that you know something by heart. For example, Solo me sé cocinar cocina francesa. I only know how to cook French cuisine. Solo me sé cocinar cocina francesa. It adds an emphasis to the meaning. You are very focused on knowing French cuisine. A mi hija le encanta esa película. Me sé todas las canciones de memoria. My daughter loves that movie. I know all the songs by heart. I'm sure many of you can relate. A mi hija le encanta esa película. Me sé todas las canciones de memoria. Mi esposo sabe mi número. Mi esposo sabe mi número. My husband knows my phone number. In other words, he has memorized it. Mi esposo sabe mi número. And here are some fun idioms that use saber. Ya lo sabía. I thought so. Ya lo sabía. Ve tú a saber. Beats me. Ve tú a saber. Yo que sé. How should I know? Yo que sé. Nunca te acostarás sin saber una cosa más. You live and learn. You, or you learn something new every day. Or more literally, you will never go to bed without learning another thing. Nunca te acostarás sin saber una cosa más. I love the little rhyme of that phrase. Anyways, oír campanas y no saber dónde. To not know what you're talking about. Or more literally, to hear bells and not know where. Oír campanas y no saber dónde. Then we have saber a poco, to be over before you know it, or to not be enough, saber a poco, and saber latin, to be on the ball, or to be very sharp. Why to know Latin means that? I don't know. I mean, I guess if you know Latin, you, you're very studious, but saber latin, to be on the ball, to be very sharp. 
All right, let's go to conocer. This verb is used when you want to convey that you know someone or are familiar with a place or thing. It's definitely more about having a connection to someone or something versus saber, which is mainly just about cold, unemotional information. Really, the differences between these two verbs is saber is head knowledge and conocer is heart knowledge. For example, yo conozco a Anita. Ella es mi tía. I know Anita. She is my aunt. Yo conozco a Anita. Ella es mi tía. Just a note, when talking about knowing a person, it is very important to include the personal a. Conocer a alguien. Such as, él conoce a David. He knows David. Él conoce a David. Ella conoce Colorado. Ella creció allí. She knows Colorado. She grew up there. Ella conoce Colorado. Ella creció allí. Now, because this is not about knowing or being familiar with a person, in this sense, you don't need to use the personal a. It's only used with people. ¿Conoces la calle principal? Do you know Main Street? ¿Conoces la calle principal? And when you use conocer, like in this sentence, you are asking if someone has been to Main Street or if they are familiar with it. Now, conocer also has a few other meanings that you may or may not know about. And although, again, there's not enough time to do an exhaustive list. So here are just a few. First is to recognize, although you may just use the verb reconocer. For example, no te conocí con esa máscara puesta. I didn't recognize you with that mask on. No te conocí con esa máscara puesta. Ella conoció su número en su teléfono. She recognized his number on her phone. Ella conoció su número en su teléfono. Second, this next meaning is conocerse. When you use it as a reciprocal verb, meaning two different people perform the same action on each other, conocer becomes conocerse, which means to meet someone or to know each other. For example, nos conocimos en la escuela. We met each other at school. Nos conocimos en la escuela. Mi hermana y su amiga se conocen desde la la guardería. My sister and her friend have known each other since kindergarten. Mi hermana y su amiga se conocen desde la guardería. And if you use it as a reflexive verb, it means to know oneself. For example, ella dice que ya no se conoce a sí misma. She claims she doesn't know herself anymore. Ella dice que ya no se conoce a sí misma. Okay, so let's kind of highlight the differences between these two verbs with some more examples. No conozco a tu papá, pero sí si sé de él. I do not know your dad. I do not know your dad, as in I have never met him, but I do know of him. Or you could just replace papá with Brad Pitt and you get the picture. In English, we make this differentiation between knowing things and knowing about them by saying, I know that place versus I know of that place. No conozco Paris, pero sé de ella. I have never been to Paris, but I know of it. No conozco Paris, pero sé de ella. No conozco esa canción, pero sí sé la letra de su canción más popular. No conozco esa canción, pero sí sé la letra de su canción más popular. I do not know, or I'm not familiar with that song, but I do know the words to her most popular song. No conozco esa canción, pero sí sé la letra de su canción más popular. And finally, ¿sabe su número? No, pero conozco su casa. So, do you know his number? Have you memorized his number? No, but I know or I have been to his house. ¿Sabe su número? No, pero conozco su casa. And lastly, some fun idioms with conocer. There aren't nearly as many with conocer as there are with saber, but here are a few. Conocer de vista, to know by sight. Conocer de vista. Conocer el paño, to be current or to be up on something. Conocer el paño. And más vale malo conocido que bueno por conocer. Better the devil you know than the one you don't, essentially. Más vale malo conocido que bueno por conocer. And that wraps up our episode on saber versus conocer. Let's go ahead to our cultural tip. All right, let's finish up our cultural tip on the Dominican Republic by talking about unique traditions. 
Now, this island has quite a lot of cool and unique traditions and customs, but today, as always, we'll focus on three really interesting ones. The first is weddings. Dominican weddings are similar to other Latin American weddings, so I'll try to focus on just the unique aspects here. For starters, the bridal party tends to be pretty small, with no bridesmaids and a few children, one to carry the rings, another to carry a white Bible, and a boy to carry the gold coins called Erras. These are 13 coins, each worth 10 cents, that are carried in on a silver tray. And the boy gives them to the priest, who in turn gives them to the groom, who then gives them to the bride. And this symbolizes how the couple promises to provide for each other and to share their possessions equally. There are the godparents, the padrino and the madrina, usually the groom's mother and the bride's father, who act as witnesses for the event. There is also the Ceremonia Cantada, or the Sung Ceremony, which sounds absolutely delightful. It begins with the groom giving a speech expressing his love for his bride, which then turns into a serenade via song or poem accompanied by a mariachi band and the wedding attendees. So can you just imagine everyone singing to you at your wedding? I'm sure for many Americans that sounds awful, but I think it could also be such a cool bonding moment like oh i bet that's really beautiful after this is the exchanging of the rings or the arros de bodas which are given to the couple by their parents or godparents a few other interesting things to note most gifts are delivered to the bride's house before the wedding not at the ceremony or reception they do not have the superstition that it's bad luck for the couple to see each other before the ceremony so it's totally fine to get your photos done beforehand Dancing at the reception is, of course, common, and they even have La Hora Loca, the crazy hour, where guests are encouraged to dance like no one's watching. And the couple's first dance as husband and wife is often a merengue dance, which is the official dance of the island, merengue. Next, we have funerals. Funerals are quite the event in the Dominican Republic. A wake will usually go all night, although the family may decide to take a break at midnight and come back early the next day. Unlike in an American funeral, where you try to contain your emotions, the family can weep without constraint. One thing I read that surprised me, if you have a nice coffin for the deceased, you might have it attacked with machetes to prevent someone trying to steal it. Now, what follows after the burial is really interesting. It is a period called Los Nueves Días, or you might hear it referred to as La Vela or El Novenario. Basically, you have a daily memorial mass for the following nine days. The first three days are for grieving, the next are for silence, and the last three are for acceptance and saying goodbye. I kind of wonder if this process is better for letting go of a loved one, because it's very specific, it devotes a lot of time to processing the loss, and it seems like it would provide a lot of communal comfort. Interestingly enough, that duty we feel to attend a funeral, that obligation to show respect for the dead and their living loved ones, is called a cumplir in the Dominican Republic. And it is expected that you go to a funeral, but... Or, at the very least, go to a Mass, but you don't have to go to every single Mass. Although I'm assuming if you're in the family, perhaps you probably do. And lastly, because as you all know, I absolutely love international food, I have added my repertoire of awesome food blogs from around the world by researching this episode. Here are three cool dishes from the Dominican Republic with links to recipes from the blog Dominican Dominican Cooking by Tia Clara. And bonus, each one has a Spanish version. Yes! I've included those, of course, in the show notes. So there is Tres Golpes, which is a popular breakfast dish, and it is super straightforward. It's made of three things, hence the name, three strikes, Tres Golpes. Mangu, which is boiled and mashed plantains. Dominican fried salami, or salami frito. And fried cheese, or queso frito, which uses their queso de freyer. Then there is sancocho, which... This island stew is served at most holiday meals, and a lot of Latin American countries have their own version of it. For the Dominican Republic, it is meat, usually beef, but the recipe I've included a link to is the ultra-fancy one, de se de carnes, or seven meats. So it's meat and root vegetables, but especially yucca, plantain, and a squash called ayama, aka West Indian pumpkin. This dish is usually served with rice, beans, and a salad. Lastly, bizcocho dominicano. This beautiful cake is supposed to be very light and fluffy, with a pineapple filling and meringue icing. They call it suspiro. It is challenging and time-consuming, but it looks delicious. I really, really want to make it. And that wraps up our final bit on the cultural tips for the Dominican Republic. Truthfully, the dance style merengue should have made this list, as it is one of the cultural treasures of the Dominican Republic, but I really want to do another episode on dances. So, when that finally happens, I will include it there. 
and you can see episode 54, the song sampler number three, Unique Dance Styles of Spanish Music, if you want to see what I'm talking about. And that's all for today. Thank you so much for listening and for your patience. And don't forget to check out the show notes for links to all of the resources used for this episode, especially if you want to dive into Saber and Conocer more, or if you want to dive more into the cultural aspects we covered in the Dominican Republic. Now, if you'd prefer to read an approximate transcription of today's episode, you can also visit the episode's blog. I would love to help you on your Spanish journey. So if you have any questions about today's episode or even just on Spanish culture or grammar, you can reach me at contact at languageanswers.com or visit my website for more information. I can also be contacted regarding my services for Spanish to English translation, English technical writing, editing, and content creation, or even language consultations and tutoring for you or your business. Remember, learning a language is a lifelong journey. So please, aprovechalo. Disfrútalo y compártelo. I will see you hopefully next week. ¡Hasta luego!